If you like looked at all the product launches from inception of crypto to now, see what's going to happen in the next 12 to 18 months. In the next 12 to 18 months is probably going to be way more than everything else combined up to this point. And if people are launching products, they're grinding for product market fit, they're going to get users, means crypto is going to survive. It's just that's going to happen. Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. This is how to get started, how to get better, how to front run the opportunity. This is Ryan Sean Adams, and I'm here with David Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. Talking about Solana today, the chips are down, prices are down, a major public backer of Solana, SBF, he's down for the count as well. He's definitely not helping the sentiment. So we brought on the Solana co-founder to ask the question, is Solana gonna make it? A few things to look out for in this episode. Number one, we go through the full story of Solana back to its earliest moments. Number two, we talk about the state of Solana today, both post FTX, uh, pre FTX as well, and at the bottom of the bear market that we find ourselves in. Well, it might not be the bottom yet. <laughs> well, we'll see. And number three, Anatoly's reaction when he first heard the news of SBF. And lastly, we ask the question that I think is on a lot of people's minds in this market. Will Solana survive the bear? And if it does, how he thinks it will make it out. David, you really wanted to have this podcast. Uh, tell us why. I've wanted to bring Anatoly on uh, for a long time. Uh, and I think right now is the best moment to do that. And that's because of, of really where Solana is as it as it relates to its community, its builders, and its leadership. I think right now the Solana ecosystem is going through a moment of self-reflection as it looked back upon its own absolutely insane bull market throughout 2021 and 2022. And I think I see a lot of parallels to how Ethereum progressed through 2017 to 2018. I kind of think Solana is doing a lot of the same, taking a lot of the same paths that Ethereum took. A crazy, crazy adoption story uh, of a bunch of just uh, what ultimately ended up to be a lot of hot air, like Ethereum had ICOs in 2017. Uh, Solana had a lot of hot air in this last 2021 bull market. Uh, and at the end of this very bad year of just downward price action, a, a big pillar that really held up the Solana ecosystem, FTX and SPF, turns out to be a complete fraud. And so because Sol the Solana community is really going through this period of self-reflection, that makes me bullish about the Solana community. That makes me really interested in seeing how they choose to take on hardship, how they choose to go about the what is going to be a very difficult long bull market to pull Solana out of the hole that it's in. And that's why I wanted to bring Anatoly on, because Solana is different than almost any other chain that, that is in crypto. It's different from all the EVM clones, Avalanche, Phantom, like whatever, in that it's got multi-client architecture. It's the only other ecosystem that has a multi-client architecture. Uh, and there was, there are, is a real builder community there. There's a real Solana community there. And so like, Ryan, I know like you and I have been branded as like, you know, ETH, and we have a big ETH bias, of course, can't really deny that. But now that we are in this bear market, our, our, my walls, I think, come, to, it feels safe to take down my walls during the bear market because of all of the crap that we flushed out during the bull market. So like my walls go up during the bull market because a bunch of newcomers come in and, uh, you know, don't really understand the deep fundamentals about what makes crypto work. And now that that is well behind us, now that we are deep inside of this bear market, the people that are here are here now here for the tech, no longer for the money. They must be here for the tech. And so that's what I see in the current state of the Solana community, people that are here for the tech. And I think now is the right time to bring on Anatoly to tell that story and to ask What's Solana going to do in 2023? Well, I can't wait to talk about that with you in the debrief because mm -hmm. uh, there's some things maybe we agree on, but I think there's some things we might disagree on about I the Solana for the ecosystem. First time, yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we'll, we'll have that discussion, that debate in the debrief. So, premium subscribers, if you want to hear all of that, the episode we record right after this episode, then click the link in the show notes, sign up for a Bankless Premium membership, and you can get access to that on the Bankless Premium feed full of special episodes that aren't available on the public feed. Guys, before we get into the episode, we want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible, and especially Kraken, who's our strategic sponsor for 2023 in the exchange category. 
It's our number one recommended crypto exchange for 2023. Go check it out. There's a link in the show notes. Kraken has been a leader in the crypto industry for the last 12 years. Dedicated to accelerating the global adoption of crypto, Kraken puts an emphasis on security, transparency, and client support, which is why over 9 million clients have come to love Kraken's products. Whether you're a beginner or a pro, the Kraken UX is simple, intuitive, and frictionless, making the Kraken app a great place for all to get involved and learn about crypto. For those with experience, the redesigned Kraken Pro app and web experience is completely customizable to your trading needs, integrating key trading features into one seamless interface. Kraken has a 24-7, 365 client support team that is globally recognized. Kraken support is available wherever, whenever you need them, by phone, chat, or email. And for all of you NFTers out there, the brand new Kraken NFT beta platform gives you the best NFT trading experience possible. Rarity rankings, no gas fees, and the ability to buy an NFT straight with cash. Does your or crypto exchange prioritize its customers the way that Kraken does? And if not, sign up with Kraken at kraken.com slash bankless. Hey, Bankless Nation. If you're listening to this, it's because you're on the free Bankless RSS feed. Did you know that there's an ad-free version of Bankless that comes with the Bankless Premium subscription? No ads, just straight to the content. But that's just one of many things that a premium subscription gets you. There's also the Token Report, a monthly bullish, bearish, neutral report on the hottest tokens of the month. And the regular updates from the Token Report go into the Token Bible, your first stop shop for every token worth investigating in crypto. Bankless Premium also gets you a 30% discount to the permissionless conference, which means it basically just pays for its Itself. There's also the airdrop guide to make sure you don't miss a drop in 2023. But really, the best part about Bankless Premium is hanging out with me, Ryan, and the rest of the Bankless team in the Inner Circle Discord only for premium members. Want the alpha? Check out Ben the Analyst's DGen Pit, where you can ask him questions about the token report. Got a question? I've got my own Q&A room for any questions that you might have. At Bankless, we have huge things planned for 2023, including a new website with login with your Ethereum address capabilities, and we're super excited to ship what we are calling Bankless 2.0 soon TM. So if you want extra help exploring the frontier, subscribe to Bankless Premium. It's under 50 cents a day and provides a wealth of knowledge and support on your journey west. I'll see you in the Discord. How many total airdrops have you gotten? This last bull market had a ton of them. Did you get them all? Maybe you missed one. So here's what you should do. Go to Earnify and plug in your Ethereum wallet and Earnify will tell you if you have any unclaimed airdrops that you can get. And it also does PO apps and mintable NFTs. Any kind of money that your wallet can claim, Earnify will tell you about it. And you should probably do it now because some airdrops expire. And if you sign up for Earnify, they'll email you anytime one of your wallets has a new airdrop for it to make sure that you never lose an airdrop ever again. You can also upgrade to Earnify Premium to unlock access to airdrops that are beyond the basics and are able to set reminders for more wallets. And for just under $21 a month, it probably pays for itself with just one airdrop. So plug in your wallets at Earnify and see what you get. That's E-A-R-N-I dot F-I. And make sure you never lose another airdrop. Bankless Nation, we have Anatoly Yakovenko. He's the creator of Solana and the co-founder of Solana Labs. Anatoly, great to have you on Bankless. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me. Hey, how is uh, 2023? Are you glad to have 2022 in the rear of your window? Uh, Dave and I were just talking about this, like whether uh, we would go back in time and crush 2022, uh, make it so it never happened or not. What's your feeling on the year <laughs> yeah. of 2022? Uh, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm glad uh, it's behind us, but it, that was the year that I was like spent obsessing over priority fees and dealing with spam on Solana. So if I could just like take that engineering effort and move it a year back, mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, how are you feeling coming into this year though? Are you feeling like burnt out? Are you feeling jaded? Are you feeling discouraged? Are you feeling uh, optimistic? Are you feeling energetic? All of the above. Like if I, I don't feel burned out. Like I think it, it'll probably take like these cycles come and go, right? Like I think uh, the 18, 19 cycle was really bad. Like people were really depressed and like nobody, like people were, I don't know, companies were just like shutting down like left and right, like people that were true believers. So far that's not happening. So there's a lot of energy that keeps you going. Like people mm -hmm. are still coming up with like crazy ideas, like things that seem like they have a one in a thousand shot of working and they're, then they believe they're the ones that are going to crack it, like Uber on blockchain, right? Like that right. <laughs> stuff like that, I think is, is like energizing because, uh, that's kind of like, 
evoking all of the promises and all the cool shit and like of an open financial system built on open source software. And there's somebody with a lot of energy that's just driving it right now. That to me is like really energizing. All the shit that happened in 22 definitely is a, is a drag and does burn you out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we we definitely feel a lot of that as well. And and Anatoly, one of the things I think we want to do on this uh, podcast today is tell the story of Solana pre twenty twenty one. I think a lot of people, a lot of the Solana community, came into Solana in twenty 2020 twenty or twenty twenty one. But the story of Solana begins actually much earlier than that. And uh, Bankless listeners will certainly know of of mine and Ryan's bias towards ETH, and so. For our own purposes, I'd also like to to hear this story as well. So sure. let's go. Let's go back to the very beginning. Where where does the story of Solana begin? What was the where was the inception moment for it? Um, so twenty seventeen. Like I've I've been following crypto loosely. Like I mm-hmm. thought it was cool to figure out if I could build like a faster miner. And our, and like my first experience, true experience with crypto was when forget the company, but they promised to ship you an ASIC. And uh, they mined all the Bitcoin with the ASIC mm-hmm. before shipping it to you. And I got like the first taste of what crypto is all about. <laughs> but I, the, I, the I, original I, front run. Yeah, I, I like thought it was like kind of silly, but um, I got it. Like, you know, my family left the Soviet Union. They saw like the full devastation of what like a centralized badly run economy and currency can do to like people and like that like belief of sound moneyness and like what bitcoin promised i think like resonated with me but i wasn't serious about it until 2017 um when i saw that one there was uh ethereum like demonstrated that there's now like an application platform and this is what i did all my entire career i build application platforms like everywhere i worked uh, um, Qualcomm, majority of my career, like if folks ever had a flip phone and ever played like any of those games, I wrote a bunch of code that made that possible. Like I was a kernel engineer at Brew and like learned how to be an engineer in, in that like in that environment. Um, so when 2017 came around and like the fees spiked uh, across all these networks is when I started noodling on uh, how do you make these things, these systems fast and efficient and cheap while maintaining like that property of mid trust minimization. Um, and I literally had like two coffees and a beer. This is a true story a Cafe Soleil. At that time I had like this cheesy side project with one of the co-founders, one of the folks that became a co-founder of, of, of Solana. We were mining crypto while building deep learning hardware. Like we were, we were into deep learning. We were putting up racks of GPUs. And we were mining crypto with it in the background to pay for the GPUs. And we were just like arguing about proof of work. Is it stupid? Like why why are people like paying for our GPUs? (laughs) 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 Like what is the point of all this? And I had two coffees and a beer and I had this like eureka moment that there's a way to encode passage of time as a data structure in a similar way that you encode entropy as a data structure in Bitcoin. You generate this difficulty, like you, you solve the difficulty challenge, right? Like you generate this long string of zeros. You can infer from that that a certain amount of energy was spent to generate that. And that means you've proven entropy, right? There's some, mm-hmm. some amount of energy was spent. And the time piece was like a uh, sequential, just run sha sequentially. Is, uh, and I couldn't Google for it because I didn't know the term verifiable delay function. I didn't know mm-hmm. that Dan Bonet and a bunch of other very smart people are working on this. And that there's very sophisticated versions of this, but that was enough to like make me think that I had something interesting because the time component is very important for optimizing wireless networks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you think of uh, censorship resistance as a communication channel, as a means for a user to send a message reliably to all the subscribers, that's what censorship resistant means, right? It guarantees mm-hmm. delivery you can think of it as a communication channel. And once you start thinking of it as a communication channel, there's a very obvious optimization called time division multiple access. This is what 2G cellular networks run on. The tricky part is the time part. How do you say that everybody agrees in a certain time? And that's a very pain in the ass problem to solve. Um, There's a bunch of papers. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. 
Can we, because uh, Ryan and I aren't developers, we kind of okay. get it, uh, but the Bankless, Bankless Nation is yeah. also going to be largely non-technical. Can we just really drill down on this like yeah. Eureka moment that you're explaining and just make sure that we, because this is this is the inception idea of Solana. Yeah. So I want to make sure that we, get, that we get this right. Could you just like do this one more time and like explain so, like I'm five? So Solana came a little later, but like just, I was just really obsessed with this, like kind of blown away by the Eureka moment that there's a way to encode passage of time as data. Because mm-hmm. there's a lot of like kind of like there's no mathematical explanation of time. There's no mm-hmm. arrow proof of arrow time moving in any direction. So it was in that sense, it like jarred me and like mm-hmm. made me like, holy shit, I think there's something really fundamentally cool about these systems. Um, why, why it was really important for Solana is because it's really hard to pick a leader. It's really hard to make a block, right, to decide who's going to make blocks. And there's a whole bunch of ways to do it. And the way that Bitcoin does it is we solve this challenge and there's a puzzle and there's a difficulty such that only roughly one person in the world every 10 minutes gets to solve it. And in Ethereum, they tuned proof of work to be, I think, as fast as proof of work could, could possibly be. It was like one in 12 seconds. And that's still much, much slower than wireless for 5G, right? Or cellular networks or any, anything that we use in the world. Um, and there's other ways to do this where you run consensus and then we elect a leader. We all, two thirds of the network agrees that Ryan gets to talk. Then after Ryan is done talking, two thirds of the network agrees that he's done talking and then David gets to talk. And that's a very stepwise process. It requires a lot of communication, a lot of rounds. And if you think of it, I have X amount of bandwidth to use for messages and, D- and Ryan gets to talk for five seconds, and then we run a whole bunch of junk that nobody gets to talk to, to select David. That's a very inefficient use of that bandwidth. That's a very inefficiently used channel. And this is why wireless protocols, they basically create a schedule and say, from millisecond zero to millisecond 100, Ryan gets to talk, then David, then Anatoly. And if you miss your slot, too bad, right? Mm -hmm. The network just keeps going, but as long as everyone is up and running and, and talking, there is no gaps right? There's no election process. Nobody has to wait for a random event. You just get to transmit. And that's basically gives you nearly 100% utilization of the hardware resources that you have. And so, just to really drill down on this point, uh, this is the main uh, architectural difference that separates Solana from, I think, almost every single other blockchain that that really exists. And this is why, uh, if if people have been following me on Twitter, why like I've given a lot more credence to Solana than I have other EVM clones like uh, Avalanche, Phantom, EVM clones. I don't really find very interesting unless they become layer twos on Ethereum. Uh, this is actually, I think, something that's actually interesting in the fact that it is actually a d- completely different design space that is unique and specifically created by Solana. Is that a fair take? Yes. The, no one else has gone this crazy route. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea is that uh, in proof of work and also proof of stake, the next person to propose a block is pretty random. Yeah. In, in Ethereum's current form, it's actually selected, but it's selected randomly which is different than than Solana. Can you can you go into the difference of how proof of stake leader election is selected and then how that's still different in Solana? Um, I don't want to misspeak about Ethereum because I'm not like 100% up on the latest design, but sure. like Tendermint is like the simplest way to, to think about it is that you have, let's say 100 validators in Tendermint, they all have one vote and then two thirds of them vote and vote on a block. There's a known block producer that's next, mm-hmm. but what's not known is whether the block producer is going to succeed or not. Sure. Let's say that's David. So we mm-hmm. wait for David to produce a block and then everybody says, hey, I did see a block from David. Let's all agree that we all saw a block from David. Okay, we all saw the block. Let's agree that the block was good. And then Ryan gets to do it. And now- So there's a, there's a block that's proposed. And then there's a round of verification, and then there's a round of verification of that round of verification, yeah. and that's the last step. And then the next step is another block is proposed. Yeah. And, and this this design structure is is able to let Solana optimize for bandwidth versus like proof of work or proof of uh, of whatever like Ethereum's proof of stake flavor is. Basically, yes. So because okay. we know, so Tendermint, you know all the leaders ahead of time too, but you have this like stepwise agreement: did David succeed or not? In Solana, mm-hmm. we don't really care. David, mm-hmm. David has 100 milliseconds, 400 milliseconds to transmit. 
if he transmitted, great. If he didn't, too bad, right? The network moves on and then somebody else goes. Now there's still forks that happen logically. So when you, David proposes a block, he's got to attach it to some previous fork that he observed and then everybody votes and agrees, was that the heaviest fork or not and stuff like that. But nobody waits for anybody to start transmitting. It just kind of goes no matter what happens. And that's in a optimistic sense, which is actually happens 99.9% .9 of the time, super majority of the network is live. There's actually no, nobody votes on a different fork. There's no forking. Everybody just transmits and votes and the blocks occur very, very quickly. And you utilize 100% of the bandwidth available to the node. So if you have a thousand validators, all of them have one gigabit of bandwidth. That's a lot. That's not a lot. That's a 22 year old standard at this point. Uh, I have one gigabit at my house. Um, you have a lot of capacity for transactions. Like in the most optimal case, in my stupid white paper, I said, I think we can stuff 700,000 transactions in there. Realistically, I think with the way internet operates and like erasure coding and all the other stuff, you can cut that in the worst case by four. And that doesn't, it doesn't matter how many nodes you have, if you have a thousand or 40,000, because of how the blocks propagate, we can actually utilize that one gigabit bidirectionally between all the nodes. And let's say that's 200,000 transactions per second mm -hmm. of bandwidth available, right? Then how do you use it? Um, that's that's kind of like the 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 other, the big question is like, how do you right. actually process it? How do you manage all the state and all of the signature verification and all this other crud? And this is where, like, the reason why I like started building Solana is like once I realized that I think we have a design that can utilize all the bandwidth available to the hardware. The other hard problems that are left were basically the bread and butter of my career and like all the folks that are worked at a Qualcomm. How do you get silicon to process a shitload of data as fast as you can and like execute as many programs, system calls, like move memory from one part of the state to another like as possible. This is like I'm sure you guys can imagine people that work at operating systems. This is what right. they do day in, day out. And this is, this is a known quantity. Right. <laughs> and this is why I, I was like, okay, we can, I see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. Like we, we have a design that as a unique way of utilizing, like that gets rid of like the overhead of consensus. It can utilize bandwidth that's available to all the machines to whatever limit those machines have. And that's an exponentially growing limit. Every two years, that gets cheaper or bigger. Um, and the rest of the problems are problems that I'm very familiar with. Like I know how to solve the memory problems, the runtime issues, like the parallelism, all of this stuff. And that that's what drove me to uh, to go like basically take the leap, become a founder, try to raise money. Um, and I got pretty lucky there. I had like. Basically a bunch of friends at Qualcomm that I worked with for over a decade. And at that time, uh, Broadcom was trying to acquire Qualcomm. Apple was suing them and they had to call like President Trump to stop the acquisition. So it was like kind of low morale internally. And I called a bunch of people and I was like, hey, we're gonna build an operating system. We've done this before. It's a new developer platform. It's for these things called smart contracts. Nobody knows what they're for, but like Ethereum was worth a bajillion dollars. So like, I think we can build something cool and unique. Um, so I never thought of like building a, an Ethereum killer. We never like marketed as like, this is the fastest smart contract platform. Our pitch was like, we think smart contracts are good for finance. Like, I think there's like an application for finance and I think finance depends on information propagating as fast as possible around the world. But that's, those are valid that assumptions, right? Yeah. Right. That was, that, that was, the, that's, <laughs> that's the Solana thesis. Yeah. Right. So like the niche, essence. the niche that we were trying to build is that because of our unique consensus design, we can guarantee that if you're participating in the network, that you're receiving state as fast as everyone else and edits like best limit, you know, 20 years of the best engineers like crank away at building Solana. When you transmit a transaction, it's going to get sent to the nearest leader. You can have multiple leaders at the same time. You don't need to schedule only one. You can actually schedule N. 
Uh, so that that gap, geographical gap, that latency is minimized. And then that leader propagates that information around the world simultaneously to everybody. So that information is moving basically as fast as a newswire can travel around the world. So for markets, that's very important. Some event happens in Singapore, that newswire literally is flying through fiber to a trader in New York. By the time that trader looks at a market on running on Solana or one running at Nisey, the prices are the same because that state transition to change the price for the news already is already propagating as well. That means that we have uh, com we can be competitive with these like monopolies on how execution and finance and everything else happens in in like TradeFi with open source software and hardware like run by volunteers. So that was like the, that's the pitch. That was the cool thing. <laughs> and and Anatoly, what one net effect of this? So this uh, this kind of consensus um, change that uh, Solana has has kind of pioneered in in that universe. Um, it sounds like it's um, really kind of maximizing. You said maximizing the bandwidth uh, available, right? And that's specifically a bandwidth for for validators. Does the net effect of that mean that if you're running a Solana validator, your bandwidth requirements are going to be higher? than say a validator from another ecosystem, say an Ethereum uh, validator. It's like, do you need that one gigabit per second kind of connection? And you need that to increase uh, over time? Is that sort of a, a, a trade-off here? Well, the way that Ethereum uh, right now works, you kind of have the same bandwidth requirements across all nodes, but with sharding, you actually, this is where the, the big, the, the, the scalability that goes beyond what Solana can do with Ethereum is when you shard the chain, you have these quorums that are separate. They have their own bandwidth requirements, and those could be, let's say, much lower. And they finalize the block, but they don't need to transmit the entire block to every other shard. You only transmit a portion of it, and because you transmit a portion to different parts of the network, you can infer that I have honest minority guarantees that no data was withheld by the shard. And if there was a fault, if this shard, trans if this shard transmitted a faulty state transition, that somebody could detect it because we have guarantees that data was propagated everywhere. But those guarantees you can achieve with sub linear bandwidth. And that's the, that's the advantage. But all of these steps are, not, are gonna be much, much slower than the newswire going from Singapore to a trader. Right. <laughs> so, so like, those are all great. And I think that's a pretty clever design. I mean, like, I love Donkrad. I've, I, I talk to him all the time. Like whenever I have like questions about like, how did you guys solve this problem in Ethereum? Um, it's like a beautiful design, but doesn't it's do different, the thing. right? So yeah. <laughs> until it's like, is, is it part of, um, the Solana mandate to, to ever, or vision or dream to ever have validators being able to run from a phone, for example, you know, Ethereum would say it is, we like validators should run from, be able to run well, from well, people's bandwidth what, constraints. What phones. do you define, can you define a validator in Ethereum? Cause like, is that like the consensus client or the full node? Well, that is somebody who uh, adds a block to the chain. A in block the producer? In a, a block producer, yeah. Mm -hmm. You can run a block producer that doesn't have the full state on Solana. So that there's like a, you basically like a block producer only really needs to like propose transactions that go into a block, pick the ones that they think are going to get them the highest ROI. Uh, so they need minute, they can guess whether those are valid or not. They don't actually need to have full access to the state. Um, but like trustlessness comes from at least one full node that has the state and can evaluate all the state transitions and say that this is the correct answer and then tell you, hey, the, the majority fucked up. And then either at least to say that or find the exact bisect the, where the majority fuck, fucked up and give you a proof that they did. This is, a, I, I would love a whole separate kind of conversation on this, almost from somebody from the kind of the engineering uh, side on Ethereum and, and uh, you, Anatoly, but we'll save that because Dave and I are not the engineers. I think we'll save right. that for, for another okay. date. But I, mm -hmm. I can I can say that kind of the, the, the pitch that you, you just talked about in 2018 is, uh, is sort of what I heard 
uh, from what Athana uh, Solana was was uh, trying to become. I, I remember one thing. The, the, the Solana, uh, Solana is a layer two on Ethereum, right? Athana. <laughs> yeah. Well, so yeah, I, I, maybe did I did I for yeah, slip that? Yeah, slip um, right there. <laughs> well, I remember hearing about uh, Solana in 2018, and mm-hmm. here's the thing that kind of threw me. And this is another maybe um, philosophy sort of difference. And I can't say that everyone in Ethereum feels this way about ETH the asset. But certainly uh, many people do. And this is, comes from a little bit of the Bitcoin school, which is um, Bitcoin is money. ETH is also money. That's central for the economic security of the network. And I remember talking to uh, Solana people in 2018 as this network was being propped up. And I was very, at the time, also interested in the Cosmos ecosystem and a few others. Uh, and um, I asked the question to kind of the early Solana startup team, hey, is Sol trying to become money? And the answer was always no. Not trying to become money. In fact, I heard similar from from Cosmos about the the Atom token. So the Atom token was never meant to be sort of a store of value type of thing. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of been consistent with what you've said about the Soul token too. Is you don't see it as a store of value as a money in the same way maybe Bitcoiners certainly see their asset as money. And I think increasingly much of the Ethereum community also sees ETH as money. Can you talk about that um, difference in philosophy in the, in the early days? Um, yeah, so like imagine a world where you had like everyone had like a magical radio that can never be interfered with or obstructed and could transmit to everybody in the world. That's a world with sense without censorship, right? I can like push a button and transmit to everybody in the world. You don't need proof of work anymore to to build a blockchain. You can you have a censorship resistant channel. I can guarantee that messages arrive to everybody. You so like the store of value part, you can build on top of a censorship resistant channel. I think store of value is a social construct. It's a meme. It's like something that people believe in. I think that's awesome. Like, and I honestly think it's very useful to have a a store of value that is not tied to any sovereign. Given like the shit show that happened in the Soviet Union, right? Like, if if you experience that one time in your life. That, <laughs> that you have like a very, uh, you, you know that it can happen again, right? Like, but it doesn't need to be tied to the consensus layer. And functionally, what the layer one chain needs to do is to prevent spam. And that's what the token does, it prevents spam. Everything else is like, I can't like code it up into a s- store of value. There's no like code change it can make. Solana is a store of value. So like, I think it's kind of dumb to, for me to like try to meme it into that. Doesn't it also though provide bes- like, econo- like security for the underlying Solana chain? It's like security of the underlying Solana chain and some of those censorship resistant properties are like based on the value <laughs> What is security? Uh, and the market cap can you, of Can you define token. security? Uh, uh, blockchain immutability. Yeah. Okay. The, and liveness? The ability to not like, not reversing blocks is okay. definitely a key property okay. here. So um, the economic, sorry, the economic cost of how how much it costs to go backwards in blocks right. is economic well, security. Well, like the with the proof of stake network, once a block is finalized, going backwards mm-hmm. is invalid. So mm-hmm. like you can create two forks, and that means the majority created a fault, mm-hmm. um, and then you got to resolve it. But like let's say one hundred percent of the validators were compromised, like all of them were compromised. So, mm-hmm. and there's nothing they can do to convince Circle to wire out your dollars from your bank account without your signature, right? Circle runs a full node. They run it in there. It's secure. It's it's unstaked. It's just seeing what these compromised validators are sending them. There's no way they can like send it in valid state transitions. So security of the network is based on this idea that if I run my full node. I can process all the valid state transitions and I know the exact state. Now, like the creating a fork, right? Creating a duplicate fork, that's an attack that you can think of as like, a, I'm mining Bitcoin in, in my hidden nuclear bunker and then I'm gonna roll back the last 50 blocks or the last 24 hours, right? That's the economic security of, of a proof of work chain. In a proof of stake chain, it's kind of a harder concept because once everyone that's finalized, Binance, Circle, all the full nodes finalize something, all the honest full nodes finalize something, they're going to reject any other fork that's proposed. They don't have this like consensus hook that says, oh, if somebody proposes a heavier 
majority signature. We're gonna throw away our state that we accepted and and like blow away all the money that like was made. Uh, all the honest all the honest nodes that are not partitioned are basically gonna halt. And now the network is stuck, and humans go in and they're like, "Well, what the fuck happened?" Did the majority double sign invalid, like make an invalid double signature or something else? And they resolve it. And that process is not based on the amount of tokens involved, what percentage or the value of them. It's going to be messy. It's going to involve a bunch of humans, right? Like, so, so then from, from your perspective and what you're describing, does it make any difference for the economic security of Solana if the sole token is like, say, 10 cents versus if it's $10? Um, for with regards to safety, no, it doesn't. The likelihood of, of like a malicious, let's say the, the token was like one millionth of a penny, right? Uh, the attacker could cause a liveness failure. They could be like, okay, I am going to buy two thirds of the tokens and then I'm going to halt the network or I'm going to create a double fork and then cause this messy process to run. And that's going to, the network's going to have to be down for like three days. That sucks, right? <laughs> so the value of the, of the coin is maybe like prevents for these liveness failures that are like messy and annoying, but it doesn't in itself prevent, it doesn't guarantee security. It, there's no way like the value of the coin has impact on circles dollars that are stuck in a bank that are, that are governed by this full node. Mm-hmm. I think listeners can definitely see some of like the the philosophical differences that 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 me and Ryan ha- share about like ETH's money versus the soul token. But I, I don't really want that. I think that's a fun explor- exploration. But I think there's a uh, much more of the overall Solana story that I want to get back I think, on track to. I think a store of value that mm-hmm. is awesome could be built on top of Solana and could mm-hmm. surpass Bitcoin. Sure. sure. Like I don't I don't see a reason why that wouldn't wouldn't be possible. Right. Right. I, w- I want to pick up Anatoly the story back because uh, okay, so we have this uh, inception of Solana, the architecture, uh, and in the implied existence of the Sol token, uh, and and so I want to pick up the story again at, at the very beginning. Where does Solana go from an an idea to an actual like Solana Labs and like all of this? Can you can you run us through that part of the story? Yeah. So I had this like idea for a VDF, which I didn't know was called a verifiable delay function. But it was like what jarred me out of like being a day-to-day worker to like, I think I should build, go build a company in crypto. So I quit my job. Got, uh, being in San Francisco at the time, you're kind of connected to people in Silicon Valley that are VCs just by being here as an engineer. Uh, one of my friends through underwater hockey, it's a weird sport that I play. <laughs> was working at 500 startups and he was like, dude, I'll give you, I forget, it was like 25K or 50K, which is more money than anyone has ever given me to do anything, uh, just on a handshake. And I was like, holy mm-hmm. shit, uh, that's like enough money for me to be on ramen for six months. I can like code a lot. If I had like, <laughs> <laughs> I can write a lot of code in six months and like actually see if this thing could work. Um, but I, uh, with the help of my partner, Laura, she's like, you got to do this for real. Like there's a moment in time that happened with social networks, with search engines, with whatever, where there's a lot of ideas and uh, a lot of people go entering a space and you have to take it seriously and go raise and, and stuff. And that's when I got connected to Raj and he has raised money before. He's not an engineer. So, and um, he was like, oh yeah, I'll help you. And like, he drilled me on like making the, the, the deck and doing the pitches and like that's that's kind of that was like whole part of the process it was the first time i ever mm-hmm. talked to anyone and like it felt really awkward telling him hey i have this idea nothing's built yet no proof but give me like hundreds of thousands of dollars so i can go hire my friends and go build this thing um what were the initial like raise details like how much did solana raise at, at, on day one we were trying to raise 500k that was like my target um Mm -hmm. the price at that time for the network was 20 million which i thought was ludicrous yeah oh you thought that was ludicrous yeah (laughs) after going after coming through 2020 like 20 million sounds extremely reasonable (laughs) think about it as like a first-time founder you guys are like yeah Yeah. first-time founder like all you have is an idea 
Right. Sure. Typical like raises in, San, in like Silicon Valley are like for that kind of valuation mm -hmm. is you have mm -hmm. traction. You're mm -hmm. like, hey, we have this right. amount of revenue. We have growth. When you guys invest in us, that revenue is going to go up. Right. Right. <laughs> That's the right. pitch. Yeah. <laughs> but that valuation, that was not like my pitch, mm -hmm. but that was, I thought it was like scary high, but if we if it was any lower there's no way we could have like funded a team to like go build right. anything um uh -huh. and i'm assuming that's what happened next like started to building on, building on a team uh how many how many employees did you guys hire in that first wave before you had to do round number two um about five people which were mm -hmm. all basically co-founders um because they were so early sure. so and these were folks that i worked with um at qualcomm for a long time like mm -hmm. Greg. I think that's still uh, fewer co-founders than Ethereum, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. probably I, a better. I, I, I basically story. like called in like all the favors that I had with my like colleagues that I've worked with over a decade, like getting folks that are like you know worked ten plus years on GPU optimization to leave their mm -hmm. very like career effectively, like pause their career at a big company and go do the startup was like a big ask. Um, but um, yeah, I got lucky with timing. Um, we did another raise in May. So we built a bunch of stuff and we built the first Solana node, like a single node that could show, hey, look, we're processing signature verification in parallel. It's doing proof of history. It was doing like a hundred, hundreds of thousands sig signature verifications per second because we like beefed this box out with GPUs and whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, and our thesis was like, look, if a single node can do this, the way that the network is designed, that the network is going to run as slow as the slowest node in the supermajority. So if a single node can be this fast, it means that the slowest node in the supermajority can be this fast. So by design, it, it should scale to that. And that was enough. I think we caught like the last vapors of the 2017 bull market. This was like May 2018. ETH was mm -hmm. dropping, funds were closing and stuff like that. But we were able to raise like a, an A round, like about... 14 million. 14 million valuation? No, like 14 oh, million. Oh, no, bucks. excuse me, raise. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. And, and bankless listeners will know, like Ryan and I have talked about the depths of the 2018 to yeah. 2020 bear market uh, and how different it is from this bear market. That bear market was dry. Like funding absolutely dried up. Yeah. And so to say, like, I really just want to drive that drive that point home. There were fumes when it come when it came to the private market funding in that in that era. Uh, and so like, I'm, sh I'm sure fighting for that, for that $14 million was not easy. So like, what was cool was that, um, people like slam us for being a VC chain, but like, even from those early days, um, there were a lot of like validators that were part of it. People out of Cosmos that were like, Hey, we like, we run Cosmos validators. We know how this stuff works and this is cool and weird. <laughs> that was basically like they'd made money on these other networks and were like, this is so weird. And just and like just based on that, like invested and in, and like some of those folks were like the they were all the first ones to run nodes and like the first ones to go like help us like find data centers to to actually like deal with us and, and stuff like that. So they one were of, one of one of the other points I would say about the kind of the VC chain uh charges like Honestly, 2018 for people who were around, like there was no other way to do it. Like, how else do you like uh, the climate at that time was like post Ethereum ICO, which sort of broke the glass on this. But the opportunity really uh, closed up. Like, there was no <laughs> compliant way to do this, uh, at least in the U.S. And so it's very very difficult to see how a chain could have raised post 2018 in the way the Ethereum ICO raised. Yeah, and being in the U.S. and like with kids, I, I was like, I want to just <laughs> not get arrested. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, sensible. Um, yeah, and uh, we got, I think, lucky enough, but a lot of our competitors raised like hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, which was who are your competitors? Hashgraph. I mean, it's the people that you don't oh, remember it at this point. <laughs> <laughs> There were like very big rounds for layer ones being filled. And a lot of folks were like, thought that we were not just not going to make it. Like, because mm -hmm. there were just too many competitors that were too, too well-funded. 
there's a, an article that an employee out of Solana Labs wrote not too long ago and, and released it uh, the December 28th of 2022. And there's a line in here that I want to get your get your take on. What exists in the Solana ecosystem now was created by the need to build f- to build everything fast. Launch the network before Labs ran out of cash, ride the wave of the crypto uh, expansion, and create an eco- ecosystem at parity with other older siblings in record time. Would you fair that? Would you say that that was a, it's a fair like characterization of like the the vibe of of Solana in the early days? The lack of like a hundred million dollar funding in the early days made us like prioritize things uh, like wolves. I guess <laughs> mm-hmm. we. I wanted like I wish we had EVM support, but it's expensive to build in in a way that wouldn't cripple the network's performance. Like. Would Solana be here? Would you guys be talking to me now if we were like an EVM chain that was like marginally faster consensus than Ethereum? Like nobody would care. Right? Like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So like stuff like that got cut and like, how do you bootstrap an ecosystem with a, without piggybacking off Ethereum devs was like a big unknown. So we were, that was a difficult challenge and we were just throwing everything against the wall that could stick. When was there a moment where like Solana was like racing to stay alive and then uh, and then that moment happened where you realized that you were going to make it? What what was that moment? Uh I hate to say it but like so 2020 we were like 9 10 months of cash left. So the market crashed we we like announced a coinless auction March 12th I think or something like that. We announced that it was going to be a week later, March 16th is when the markets crashed. And I was like, fuck, (laughs) we are so dead. But I was just too exhausted to delay. And we really didn't have an option. There was no like, at that time, there was no bridge round coming. Like the funds that we thought were like, could back us were also like, holy fuck, we've never seen anything like this before. So like, we have no advice to give you. Like, so we decided to launch because I was, I think, my my theory was that like the worst time to launch would have been right before the crash. Uh, so if we launch right after, there's a chance that this is like a huge overcorrection and then we just see at least a, a medium upswing. And that turned out to be like the bottom of the bottom and then like it started the, the crazy bull run. So that was that was pretty wild. And then we started seeing, I would say the second hackathon is when I thought that we had real traction uh, because you saw some teams from the first hackathon that were just fucking around with the network and built like, like very cheesy dumb apps that uh, like that didn't do anything. Like uh, you vote to have like a fighter fight <laughs> on a chain or something like that. Some of those folks came back and started building like DeFi Mango and like whatever. And I was like, okay, people actually like did didn't hate the runtime. Didn't hate, like they got something out of it and they like had an idea that was unique and they built it and it was that was like i thought i thought there was something there like basically after after the second hackathon Mm -hmm. and when did uh multi-coin capital step into the picture were they were what round were they in they were in the early days okay yeah uh what was was that the uh uh, the 12 million dollars or the one before that no the 20 yeah this was like so we ended up we wanted to raise 500k we -hmm. had it (laughs) <laughs> we had it like verbally committed. Then ETH dropped like 30% in one day and all mm-hmm. these funds pulled out. But we managed to actually end up raising about 3 million during that round after like mm-hmm. a lot of hustling and, and conversations. And like, but there was like a moment that I was like, okay, fuck, I think maybe this is not going to happen. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, okay, so we're we're coming out of the depths of COVID. Solana is starting to get traction. You mentioned two hackathons where, like, one the second one started to produce real outcomes. Uh, how fast did things accelerate? Um, yeah, things were started moving pretty quickly because we were focused on driving more hacker hackathons. We did an, we did another one and. Twice as many people showed up. I don't, I don't know the exact numbers, but it was a significant bump from the previous one. From the second one to the third one, there was a sig- significant number of increase in registrations and teams that completed. And the quality of the teams went up. Um, and that got us, that was basically when we had our launch, announcer conference breakpoint. Um, 
and like Breakpoint was the first one was pretty cool. There were a lot of uh, people that showed up that were just I think high in the euphoria of the bull market, um, mm -hmm. and not as many builders. Um, mm. But the cool thing there was that you kind of had like a bunch of the devs on their own. They like got a space and they called it a hacker house, and they just like ran away from all the bull market people and just coded <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> on their own. <laughs> this seems a lot like the Ethereum community in like yeah. 2017, where Vitalik got exasperated with like, he, I remember Vitalik saying, I will leave this space if we keep talking about like Lambos and moon coins. It kind of sounds like a little bit like that. Yeah. Uh, and like, that was pretty cool because that was, Again, we we just then copied that model. It's like, okay, there's a bunch of devs that actually want to go build stuff. Why don't we like run these hacker houses from one one city to the next? And then we did a bunch of hacker houses and hackathons. And that year of doing hacker houses and hackathons leading up to breakpoint, even though the market turned around and every everything started dumping, was actually pretty awesome. There's a lot of stuff got built. There was a lot of devs, like the whole NFT space like happened during that cycle. Like you literally, you know, Magic Eden didn't exist, you know, <laughs> like Phantom, like actually became like, I think uh, a pretty awesome wallet that everyone I think knows about at this point, if, if not used. So a, a bunch of really cool stuff happened. And the second breakpoint was awesome. It's like 40 teams that were building games. We didn't have a games thing, even at, at the first breakpoint, like, um, the number of attendees went up by like nearly doubled from the first breakpoint. So despite this like market drop of Solana's peak down to whatever 30 bucks was a 95% drop, right? By <laughs> the number of attendees to the conference nearly doubled. The number of devs that showed up was like 1600. It was a pretty awesome vibes up until the very last day is when on the flight back, everyone started uh, seeing the shit show with F with FTX. Yeah, yeah, we'll get there. But I, but I want to cover uh, really like the throughout 2020 and 2021 because Solana, the sole price uh, between the the start of 2021 to the end of end of 2021, did probably perhaps the craziest thing any crypto token has ever almost ever done ever, which is like go up 20,000 percent. 20, in in uh, a little bit over a year, uh, and I mean, I would imagine that went from like Solana thinking about like, damn, we're running on fumes. Are we going to make it? We need to we need to get through this to like, oh my god, we've like, what have like the, everyone's here? Like, what is go? What the hell is going on? Can you can you walk us through like that that part um, of that transition from 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 A to B? Yeah. So like, I think part of the reason of that is that because we were a, an underdog earlier, mm -hmm. even compared to like the cohort of competitors like Avalanche and Nier and all those guys, they raised at higher valuations from VCs, raised more capital than us, or when they launched their mm -hmm. entry price was higher. Solana's coinless auction to launch was 22 cents. It cleared mm -hmm. at like, what is that? 104 million or something like that, which is mm -hmm. what Bitcoin was worth when it was just listed on Mt. Gox. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was not, uh, nobody thought there was no hype at that point. So the delta from that to, I think we passed the cohort, uh, Avalanche and Ethereum, and uh, not Ethereum, Avalanche and like Nier and a bunch of those other folks and Polkadot. That I think was surprising to everybody. And that that's, I think, part of the reason of these like massive multiples. But right. Do you think it's fair uh, in, in the contrast to other chains like Phantom, Avalanche, like Nier, do you think calling Solana a VC coin is fair if if we're not calling those chains VC coins too? Uh, I don't know. To, to what degree do you do you uh, say that that's like a fair branding? I mean, like, I know, the, I know the, that's the a hard very question. dumb thing about this whole VC narrative is that like the crypto uh -huh. VCs in 2018, nearly all of them were people that invested in the Ethereum ICO, and that's how they became mm -hmm. VCs. They, mm. <laughs> like, mm. these were literally the Ethereum backers that believed in smart contract platforms and saw the future of this tech. They made big bets on the Ethereum IC ICO. They wrote it to like 1300 in 2017 and they created a fund. Nearly all of these folks that were like the VCs of that era came from that. 
Um, hmm. Like A16Z and a bunch of these other folks were not super active at the time. Um, so that's that's kind of like, I think the weird branding, sure, like, I don't know, like, I, I don't really care about the VC branding. I think it, it's just pretty dumb, like to begin with, like, are there mm-hmm. institutionals that hold a shitload of ETH? Probably, like, does that make it a trade fight chain? No, like, it's the people building stuff that make the chain. <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, what was it like? Uh... I, I, whenever, uh, cause Ryan and I have experienced this, whenever you, uh, like are kind of, uh, whenever you experience success, you start to get haters. Right. And perhaps Ryan and I contributed to that to whatever we, degree we did. We're, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but what, wh- when did like the ETH maxi crowd come in and w- what was that like to be on like the receiving end of that? Um, it was honestly like not, uh, I guess stuff that I see on I, Twitter, like, is I just take it for granted as this is just people like being on Twitter growing up in the Mm -hmm. 90s and forums and bulletin boards. You just like shit post about everything. People were getting in like flame wars about Linux file systems, literally. (laughs) Like, (laughs) Mm -hmm. like, so, but when I talk to people that are in the ETH community, again, a lot of those folks that were early Ethereum backers back Solana, a lot of the super early, those folks became validators and like started businesses that are multi-chain. I never felt like, there was like a hate coming out from like, especially not from like Vitalik or Justin or Duncrat or any of the core devs. Like, I think they've been awesome and like super helpful. So the ETH, like people shit post on Twitter, I think it's just like, I don't know. I don't even know if they believe what they're saying. They're <laughs> whatever. I, I don't really like get it, the, let it get to me. Um, stuff that's, I think, valuable that comes out of that is like arguing about decentralization, like actually getting to the um, nuance of trustlessness. Like how do you minimize trust? What what are the trade-offs with sharding? What are the trade-offs with big hardware systems like Solana? Like, I think a lot of value is actually created there by getting the terms right, getting to the nuance of the trade-offs. So like, in some ways, like uh, like my conversations with Donkrat, it has have influenced like Solana's design. It's like this is awesome. I do think that's an underutilized tool of uh, of Twitter, and sometimes can be drowned out by all of the noise. Uniswap is the largest on-chain marketplace for self-custody digital assets. Uniswap is, of course, a decentralized exchange, but you know this because you've been listening to Bankless. But did you know that the Uniswap web app has a shiny new fiat on-ramp? Now you can go directly from fiat in your bank to tokens in DeFi inside of Uniswap. Not only that, but Polygon, Arbitrum, and Optimism Layer 2s are supported right out of the gate. But that's just DeFi. Uniswap is also an NFT aggregate letting you find more listings for the best prices across the NFT world. With Uniswap, you can sweep floors on multiple NFTs and Uniswap's universal router will optimize your gas fees for you. Uniswap is making it as easy as possible to go from bank account to bankless assets across Ethereum. And we couldn't be more thankful for having them as a sponsor. So go to app.uniswap.org today to buy, sell, or swap tokens and NFTs. Arbitrum 1 is pioneering the world of secure Ethereum scalability and is continuing to accelerate the Web3 landscape. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum 1, producing flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. With the recent addition of Arbitrum Nova, gaming and social dApps like Reddit are also now calling Arbitrum home. Both Arbitrum 1 and Nova leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. On Arbitrum, both builders and users will experience faster transaction speeds with significantly lower gas fees. With Arbitrum's recent migration to Arbitrum Nitro, it's also now 10 times faster than before. Visit Arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first dApp. With Arbitrum, experience Web3 development the way it was meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. Hey, Bankless Nation. If you're listening to this, it's because you're on the free 
Bankless RSS feed. Did you know that there is an ad-free version of Bankless that comes with the Bankless Premium subscription? No ads, just straight to the content. But that's just one of many things that a premium subscription gets you. There's also the token report, a monthly bullish, bearish, neutral report on the hottest tokens of the month. And the regular updates from the token report go into the token Bible, your first stop shop for every token worth investigating in crypto. Bankless Premium also gets you a 30% discount to the permissionless conference, which means it basically just pays for itself. There's also the airdrop guide to make sure you don't miss a drop in 2023, but really, the best part about Bankless Premium is hanging out with me, Ryan, and the rest of the Bankless team in the Inner Circle Discord only for premium members. Want the alpha? Check out Ben the Analyst's DGen Pit, where you can ask him questions about the token report. Got a question? I've got my own Q&A room for any questions that you might have. At Bankless, we have huge things planned for 2023, including a new website with login with your Ethereum address capabilities, and we're super excited to ship what we are calling Bankless 2.0 soon TM. So if you want extra help exploring the frontier, subscribe to Bankless Premium. It's under 50 cents a day and provides a wealth of knowledge and support on your journey west. I'll see you in the Discord. So we've talked a lot about kind of the 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 birth and the growth of Solana and you know 2020 and 2022, uh, but you said something really interesting uh, about uh, you know t actually uh, 2022 specifically, and that you were at the Breakpoint conference, I believe, when some of the FTX stuff started to to bubble up. Um, can you just tell me about like that whole experience? Because I feel like up to that point. Um, the Solana community in, in general um, fared fairly well. I mean, it was a rough year for crypto, right? We had Terra Luna. Uh, that was really bad for the Terra Luna ecosystem, of course. Then we had Three Hours Capital, and we had kind of Crypt Celsius, uh, CeFi is very shaky. You know, through all of that, Solana seemed kind of fine. Of course, price is down, but price is down everywhere. Um, but this particular event, the FTX kind of event and the unfolding of that had to hit the Solana community hard. In fact, I know it did, um, partially because I think whether whether fair or not, um, Sam Bankman fried was seen as uh, a champion of Solana. And I think he was very much in, in the early days. So tell us about that event. When did you first catch wind of that? What were the thoughts going through your head and, and how did that affect you and uh, the Solana community? There's like, it was basically in the flight back is when I started seeing the tweets coming out of like Sam and Binance and like that interaction between Alameda and like the balance sheet being leaked was like, was like the so the first kind of like flag, but I didn't take it seriously. It was like, huh, this balance sheet is that really what Alameda has? That seems like not not great. <laughs> like it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> and that like that seeing Binance's reaction and CZ like making that tweet and then how Alameda responded was when like my stomach started turning. Like holy shit. Like this might like be like a pretty bad event, but no, I, again, like I was really, really shocked when like it unraveled to the point that it did. Like mm -hmm. basically when Sam said that he's trying to sell FTX to Binance was like, holy fuck, something bad really, really happened. <laughs> like, and but, how, how would you, before that, how would you characterize like, uh, Sam's relationship with the Solana community? Was he a supporter? Uh, he was obviously an investor at, at some level, but like, how was he involved? In the early days, like it was a big deal. I think uh, like that, you know, again, no one really heard of Solana. We just launched trying to get people to code in this like weird Rust environment where it felt like writing Linux kernel drivers. The Sam saying that they're going to build Serum on Solana was a big deal. That's That actually, I think, got a lot of developers to turn their heads and, and be like, okay, there's something here that's interesting. Because I think uh, FTX engineers had a pretty high reputation for like being like, you know, 10x engineers, if you want to call them that, but like being a small team that can ship a lot of product and make good decisions, like engineering decisions. Um, that drove, I think, a lot of DeFi interests and like got a lot of folks in the early days to start building stuff. Um, there was this like kind of relationship between us and them where like if we had like product ideas or something like that, like we could talk to them and be like, hey, is this like an API? Can you guys add it or something like this? 
that was like based on this assumption that like they have a lot of soul they're aligned with what solana wants to do and they will like help us unblock stuff that's really really hard in crypto because of all the regulatory hurdles you have to jump but they have all the licenses that do all the kyc checks for their customers they can build really good experiences for people to like onboard so like for example like the nft marketplace we wanted to build like was open source give the tools to creators let them fork github and go launch their own auction houses and that was the birth of metaplox it was like very wordpressy they wanted like a centralized one that they controlled the experience that ran the markets on ftx but they used the source code that we built and they built that experience and uh it was the same data structure so those nfts could move in and out of solana and that was awesome. Like, I think they tried to go get product market fit for that thing and it failed. Metaplex, I think, succeeded. So stuff like that, like, was more like product engineering, like, flowing. Um, but that, like, collapse was, like, really painful to watch because I think a lot of people saw Sam as, like, one of the pillars of Solana, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. Like, why, why would you build on Solana? Well, because Sam is building on it, right? And therefore, like, I'm in, in a good group of people that are building awesome stuff. It was kind and, of like a Joe Lubin type figure, not right. kind of a co-founder, yeah. but like almost like a consensus, it felt like a little bit. They could like build stuff like consensus kit. Consensus is like 2,000 people, mm -hmm. right? Like, I think that mm -hmm. we are an org with like, Labs is like 75 people. We just don't have that scale to go build a bunch of stuff. Um, having that like, disappear overnight was like pretty shocking mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and jarring and like i was like holy fuck is this right. <laughs> like is, is everything gonna die now <laughs> okay so like shocking and jarring uh i i will tell you 2022 shook my faith in people yeah uh once yeah. again at a level i don't think i felt even in in 2018 uh, kind of like yeah. faith in humanity faith in people that i thought were i mean Many, many folks were on one high pedestals in uh, the crypto community, and they just um, completely failed from a it trust it, perspective. 2022 shook me like 2008 sounded like it shook people. Yeah. Did, did you feel that? I mean, like, it, are, are you immune to that? Are you impervious? Or like, <laughs> people are people. Like, and... <laughs> did I get like burned out <laughs> on that? Right. And I like, I don't even know. Um. I'm a very kind of trusting person. Like I didn't have any reservations with like working closely with Sam and maybe in retrospect, you gotta like, you sh probably should like be cautious about with anyone in crypto and that like, and I don't yeah, like yeah. being that. I don't like having to think like, are there alternative motives or are they doing something shady? Cause it's just like, it's exhausting. It sucks. I think, and, <laughs> and knowing how like developers think and work, I think that you and Anatoly are, are a dev who wants to do dev things. And so probably to like have to consider is SBF a good actor or not is like not, it's not, you just want to build, right? Is that a fair take? Yeah. We wanted to like make the network faster and like get more shit on, more, more people using mm -hmm. it. I think that if I want to put on my my uh, super critic hat of Solana, and I'll, I'll like this is echoed in like a lot of like the ETH Maxi circles, is that like Solana just ended up being a place for mercenaries in this last bull market. SBF being one of them. There was that guy that like spun up like a bunch of like that ecosystem of DeFi apps that pumped up the TVL. Now being investigated by the DOJ. Like, do you, would you say like the ETH criticism, the ETH Maxi criticism of Solana as just like a place for mercenaries to operate? Uh, how, how would you feel about that 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 critique of Solana inside of its like twenty twenty one to twenty twenty two era? Um, I think though those folks definitely suck. Like, I'm not disagreeing with you there. Um, I don't know if Solana had like more of the than ethereum or like proportionally more even um because there was a lot of like shit that happened on every on, on ethereum as well and those i mean would it be wrong for me to say that like those were the two growing ecosystems that uh, in in that era that actually experienced pretty rapid growth finance march into right like i think bsc came out and like brewed a pretty substantial side and also experienced a, a big pile of like shitty actors um, I think, I don't know what, like we can do better 
as like a community uh, to kind of like have an immune response to push those people out faster. Um, like there's just some stuff that's like, I kind of thought would happen on its own. Like people would pick open source software over closed source, but they don't. They just like pick whatever is like the shiny new thing. And they don't really like look beyond that. So that was like, to me, kind of surprising that you saw the market not resolve that on its own. And like simple things like that, like is the dev building immutable smart contracts that are open source that have been audited and like was the development done in the open? That would probably filter out like 99% of these folks, <laughs> like just because the folks that want to take those shortcuts are the ones are the ones that are trying to like, you know, uh, take people's money, right? Like and and like for, and lie or whatever. Mm -hmm. There, the uh, that same article that I was referencing earlier, it, titled on Medium, the year that Solana blew up, uh, in blew up in a good way. It might it might have a double meaning uh, <laughs> when FTX blew up, but uh, there uh, there was a, a part on cultural debt that I thought was was really really interesting and something that like I really enjoyed reading out of uh, especially when it coming from somebody who worked at Solana. The uh, the uh, they wrote as a result we have a massive cultural debt in our community, one that must be repaid. What do, what what make what do you think when you hear this? What I what I think about is that like there are a lot of projects that kind of launch as fast as they could to get either funding or product market fit or users. And they didn't like audit. They didn't do open source development from the start. They didn't build immutable smart contracts. They didn't use a like governance or like a multi-sig for, for their upgrades authority, like that kind of stuff I think mm -hmm. is like very sloppy. And it's mm -hmm. something. And you think that got like instilled a little bit too deep in the Solana culture for that bull market? I mean, what's weird is that like Armani and like, the core Solana devs that you like look at that are like, you know, Armani, the Cheeto guys, Manga, like all those folks are like doing the right thing. They like build, like labs didn't build the tooling for people to verify their programs on chain. <laughs> like they did, <laughs> right? Like they, they did all of the stuff to like, because they wanted to see it. And those are like the people that uh, when I look to like, who are this core Solana developers, there's those folks. And there's like a whole bunch of people in the periphery that were trying to make money as fast as they could that like took those shortcuts. I don't know how, like, how we correct that, or is that a self-correcting thing? Because over time, it's just those devs are the ones going to, are going to be here in the next cycle and all the other assholes are not. I'll, I'll tell you my take on that. I, I do think it's kind of um, self-correcting if you can survive. And one of the one of the signs as, as somebody who's um, been interested in the Solana community, but kind of wait and see what happens, is I almost feel like um, bear markets are so good for purifying. I think the mm -hmm. the charge purge. that um, David <laughs> just said, yeah, it's a purge um, of you know Solana being f full of mercenaries. This is exactly what Bitcoiners said about Ethereum. Uh, in 2018, basically, there's all these ICO scams. Who, who in Ethereum yeah. who was here for the right reasons could deny there weren't a lot of people that took advantage of the base layer of Ethereum to raise scammy ICO pump and dumps and exit. Uh, a ton of that happened, um, but they weren't the people that stuck around. And so, from my yeah. vantage point, Anatoly, I, I've very much been paying attention to uh, how the Solana community fares during this bear market season. It's, it's being tested in kind of the, the fiery crucible of a bear market. And if it survives, if it shows sign of life, if the builders continue to build, that to me is a, is a bullish sign that uh, Solana is gonna persist and continue doing meaningful things for the community. Uh, so it's almost in some light way when we were talking about at the beginning, like how about 2022 is like, was it a good year? Would you race it if you could? Um, I wouldn't. In fact, I think that, um, and this might sound, okay, it's like, if I were to say something to the Solana community, I think that this is a blessing, actually, mm -hmm. for Solana to actually have to go through this. It was too easy, wasn't it? It can't be this easy. You can't just go from like <laughs> 11 freaking cents or whatever to like $250. 20,000%. You can't just do that. All right. <laughs> there has to be some uh, trough of disillusionment. There has to be some washout. Yeah. There has to be some purification, some testing uh, along the way for Solana to really figure out what its culture is, what its values are, and whether the builders are going to continue to build. 
So uh, that's what I'm kind of looking for. And I, I don't know if we're in the section of we get to talk about like future for Solana yet. There might still be some other mm-hmm. things to cover, but uh, I, I don't know if you share that sense with me, Anatoly. Like this is the the testing phase for the community. Oh man, <laughs> it's uh, it, the testing phase sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it does suck. <laughs> yeah. Uh it sucks. I want to like the it sucks cuz it's like deflating for a lot of the people that are doing the right things that are taking right. slower. I think that happened on Ethereum as well, but like I think mm-hmm. the like Compound and Ave and all those folks are, are are awesome, right? They they built really good products and like they're an example that I think everyone should look up to. Um, I hope we have like the same kind of cohort of people survive that can become leaders like in the next cycle. But getting through this phase sucks for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so Anatoly, he, here we are in 2023. And I kind of want to just do like a snapshot, uh, an audit of the current state of Solana. Because there are some parallels that I see to the state of the Ethereum community, not necessarily the Ethereum project, because there's philosophical differences that will always make it different, but the state of the Ethereum community and the state of the Solana community, right? Uh, Solana is just coming out of the overhang of SBF, right? And FTX, massive forced seller of soul into the market. I kind of see a similar parallel of honestly, like Joe Lubin and consensus in Ethereum 2018 big forced seller of ETH because of the operating cost of consensus. And to, to say absolutely nothing about any sort of similarity between Joe Lubin and, and SBF couldn't be more different. Just the nature of the forced selling of a large holder of the bag. And then also like in Ethereum 2018, you had the ICO treasuries, big just sellers into the market. And between like like Joe Lubin selling for consensus, ICO selling in uh, because of their treasuries, like just drove the ETH price down. And I kind of see that with FTX being a forced seller and also funds, I th- uh, you know, unsure, uncertain rumors uh, about like multi-coin being, a f- uh, being needing to, to sell their soul like, and selling their soul into the market as well. And other funds as well, you know, all of the VCs that did own soul. And in Ethereum, when all the ICOs sold their ETH, it was a massive distribution. Same thing with consensus. Same thing with like Joe Lubin, one of the biggest, most concentrators holders of ETH. All the ICO treasuries, big concentrated holdings of ETH, had to sell it into the bottom of the market to the few remaining community members who uh, were the the still bullish on the future of Ethereum. And that has to be what's going on with Solana right now, where you had the concentrated VCs, uh, you had the four seller of FTX selling soul into the market and distributing the the soul token to the last remaining people who are who are bullish Solana. That that's my like snapshot of like where Solana is. And so, can is that a fair take? And and can you kind of provide your own like audit of the Solana ecosystem? Like, how, how are people feeling? And where are they? Where are they at right now? I mean the. A lot of like the stuff that's happening, I think in, in like, that's pretty exciting is like development of new DeFi protocols, Zeta Drift, like folks building like new perpetual markets and like figuring out how to use the chain for, to like get to that vision of like, let's replace TradeFi and run it on Solana and like have an, have like a competitive system to, to Nancy. That's happening. I think. That's pretty exciting. And those are really dedicated teams that are, that are working really, really hard. Um, and that sucks because DeFi has been like hurt the most uh, on the network, but I'm like pretty stoked about that. Um, the NFT community is like uh, very thriving. It's like, I think arguably the second, it's the second largest, right? And then crypto, would you guys agree with me? It seems like by activity and by like numbers, it's half about half the size of Ethereum. Um, that's very like uh, I'm like proud of that. Like I didn't do it, <laughs> I didn't do anything, but like it's awesome. It's awesome to see that. Uh, and like those folks are having fun and like building cool shit and and like creating memes and like trying to build brands or whatever. Uh, and there's always constant controversy because it's big enough to where that's just a continuous thing. But that that is awesome. Um, a lot of the mobile kits for the Solana mobile, all the dev kits sold out. So we have like 
a very strong, I don't know how, how that's going to translate to consumers, but there's a very strong like developer, like uh sigh of relief that there is like a chance for an app store that isn't controlled by Apple or Google. <laughs> that's coming from, from the folks in the community. I think that's, that to me is pretty awesome. Um, I don't know if people are still like kind of down in the gutter thinking about like FTX and all this stuff that maybe, I don't know. Like, I think the, the bear market was so bad up until that point that maybe this was like, uh, like bad news in the best possible time. Like it just happened. The bandaid is ripped off. Now everyone's thinking about the future. Like my personal like vibes are like. Um, I'm a bit exhausted from like the negative news and I want to see like some wins. I want to see people launch products and build cool shit, um, that, that you can't really do anywhere else. So that to me is like what I'm, what I'm excited about. Well, Anatoly, one of the things that make me really optimistic about the current state of Solana is Solana is the only blockchain in crypto after Ethereum that has a second client. And this is like one of these like things about crypto that makes me feel like I'm taking crazy pills that no one cares about having a multi-client architecture about their blockchain. It's, it's insane that Bitcoin is like only one client. And if there's a bug in it, that is that bug is Bitcoin. That's Bitcoin. We're going to run with that bug. Like that's insane. That's crazy. And so like, I see a lot of like the fact that Solana is developing Fire Dancer, I think in partnership with Jump, I think maybe you can go into the details, but that's to me a huge vote of confidence that we finally have a second blockchain ecosystem that has a multi-client architecture. So I kind of want to lead and open up this next conversation. The last bit of this conversation is like the future of Solana as like what make us bullish about the future of Solana. Like what, what's make it like entice us to like stick around in the community during the bear market and maybe you can also dive into the to the second client so i mean people are always worried about like scalability how's it going to scale where are you going to get more mm -hmm. throughput if it's a monolithic chain with no sharding um mm -hmm. and like fire dancer is like uh the example of how you can use software to utilize commodity hardware stuff you can buy off the shelf to move a lot of memory and a lot of signatures through these systems and like scale the network They've done demos that are like on the, this is like the block producer stage that can handle like 600,000 to a million transactions per second on a, and this is on commodity hardware, like dual, dual, dual CPU, like Intel systems. They're expensive, but you can buy them. And by the time you need that much capacity, it's going to run on like whatever, <laughs> whatever desktop you can buy uh, on fries. The cool thing about it is that it's just performance optimizations. There's not like protocol changes. There's no like magic unknown science fiction that we need to build. Uh, it's fairly straightforward stuff that like every database engineer like has gone through, like when they need to go from like, when they need to step level the, the performance of, of the system. Um, so it's gonna get done. It's just gonna work. I'm like very confident that there's no like, <laughs> there's no magic that needs to happen. Um, and it's a second client. And why a second client is important in a high performance system. Like, I think you can argue that Bitcoin is so slow that with 10 minute blocks, if something goes wrong, that the community has enough time to like maybe revert eight hours worth of blocks or something like that. And that's reasonable. What that means about Bitcoin finality is like a whole other topic. <laughs> but for mm -hmm. a high performance system, we need guarantees that the state is final. And with two clients, if they ever diverge, the network halts. So at a gut level, you're you're actually trading liveness for safety. Like if if humans wrote this code and humans are failable and they wrote bugs, and those bugs are catastrophic to where there's a state invalid state transition exploit, then two systems written by two different groups of people in different languages, different tools, it's very unlikely that they'll have the same bug. And if they ever diverge and the network has at least 33% on, on both clients, then the network will halt and humans will be like, are needed to go figure out why. Now, if you had four clients, it's even better. And I think the goal for Ethereum is to have four clients, right? Um, so if you have, then it's very unlikely that two of them will have the same bug. So one of them goes down, 75% of the network is still live and you maintain liveness. Now to get to four clients, 
they'll take a lot of work. But eventually, the cool thing about what Firedancer is doing is they are also building a spec of what Solana is. So it's much, much easier to where like there's an agreed upon spec of all the definitions of all the protocols and formats um, that's all in one place for somebody to again then go look at like, okay, this is how Labs did it. This is how Firedancer did it. We can rewrite this and go or whatever and, and make it plenty fast. And now you can have three or four clients. That's five years from now, maybe like will be a priority. But like V0, I think we need to get to a second client simply because safety is paramount. Like, and then like what keeps me up at night is like the scariest thing in the world is a code execution bug in the runtime that causes like tokens to be minted or state to be corrupted. And like, that's catastrophic. That That's like the scariest thing. Um, and like, it's code written by humans, you know, like the best engineers working on the Linux kernel sometimes introduce zero days. And that, that's just really, really frightening. I think the other unique thing uh, that differentiates Solana from any old uh, EVM clone is uh, its VM. Can you uh, uh, talk about the Solana VM and how it's unique and differentiated from other VMs in the space? Yeah, everyone that like used the Ethereum VM just got a free ride, which is smart. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're using a VM that's securing a very large amount of dollars, right? And, you, and that's a very mm -hmm. large bounty uh, to find every possible bug. Uh, but you are giving up a lot of performance. Like the, like, as I earlier described, like the whole point of Solana is like, we, um, we like remove the, the cap on bandwidth. If the network has X amount of bandwidth, it can stuff all of it with transactions. It means you can have very large amount of throughput, like hundreds of thousands of TPS on old school one gigabit standards. Now the hard part is then like, how do you actually process all of them and how do users actually take advantage of the throughput in a single state machine um, that's a it's very very tricky to actually write systems that uh, allow for parallelism for on, on the at the user level so the runtime as it's designed is built kind of from the ground up with that idea like we built the system so when transactions flow, flow through this thing they can be processed in parallel as fast as possible and um that's very different from how EVM is constructed. And that means that like we had to build not only just the consensus layer and like a whole and like the tooling and all this other shit, we also had to build an EV, uh, like a EVM equivalent, like a, a Turing machine equivalent virtual machine. Um, if we didn't do that, like you would basically see like kind of a slightly faster Ethereum. <laughs> that could do maybe mm -hmm. like 30 to 50 TPS. Like it would be very limited by how EVM works and how mempools work and a whole bunch of other stuff. So Anatoly, um, very much like Ethereum, I think in the depths of 2018, um, some people out there, maybe even a lot of people out there are saying Solana is not going to make it. Right? They're not saying that about Bitcoin. I still don't think they're saying that about Ethereum. I mean, some people are saying all of crypto is not going to make it, but let's put those haters aside, all right? That's a, we don't, a we different don't podcast. He's not a typical bankless <laughs> listener. But some people have doubts about Solana. Is Solana going to make it through the bear? What is your case for why Solana will make it through this bear market out on the other side stronger? Is Solana the token or the network? The network. And the also, my answer well, would be yeah, the yes network. to that. Uh, let's let's <laughs> talk about both. <laughs> The network, both, will, yeah. the network will make it. I mean, like the tech is there. Like if it's, it's just like, go fork it and run Solana, new Solana or whatever. Right. <laughs> like the code is there. It's awesome. People like using it. So like, I think in that sense, we have enough traction and enough like devs that want the, to keep this thing going to where it'll keep going. Um, the rest is like, I think, very much macro dependent. I think that's like a, a big question for like probably all of the smart contract platforms except for Ethereum is like, it, are we going to be in like a high interest rate environment for the next five years where everything gets all the like all the riskier bets get squeezed down and there's no traction. That means that there's nothing for Solana to do that's useful to the world that Ethereum doesn't cover, even if Solana is a hundred times faster, right? Even if we do more transactions and all the Ethereum L2s combined, they're not providing enough value to the world in that environment. If they're not, that means it's not going to survive. 
Now that's like the big the big if, and that I don't know. Like that's a big if for crypto. What is crypto doing right now that is so crucial to the world that it can't live without it? Um, How do you feel about Solana's chances then? How do you feel about that bet? I think um, honestly, I, I feel pretty good. Like I think the fact that um, we have like this thriving NFT community, which was built totally accidentally, like neither myself or Raj or like NFT gurus, <laughs> it just happened because the UX was better and it was cheap and fast. And no one has been able to replicate that uh, and like get the get that going. I think to me it speaks that there's something there in the tech that'll continue like derive value to the real world from from the chain. And if there's like companies like Magic Eden or whatever, and the, the long tail of like NFT startups that have real world revenues, they're actually like making money on the web that excludes the like ad tech. Like it's not Google revenues anymore. It's like Web3 crypto weird revenues that are people like they have with like hundreds of thousands of users. It means the underlying base layer will survive in some, some shape or another. And that, that's awesome. Like, this is like my bear, I put on my like worst hat, bear hat, everything's going to shit, interest rates are 10%. <laughs> Are is like the Web3 NFT business model survive? I think so. And if that's true, I think Solana survives. You got to feel better about your chances than uh, versus 2018 when you whole started this whole thing, right? Um, <laughs> I'm, I felt... Uh, Chances are, I feel like way more bullish now than 2018, 2019. <laughs> like, uh, like people don't even, I mean, there's so much funding that's still happening in crypto. There's so many like smart young people that are like not joining the, the big companies and, are, and like building awesome products. Um, my guess is if you like looked at all the product launches from inception of crypto to now, to what's going to happen in the next like, 12 to 18 months. In the next 12 to 18 months is probably going to be way more than everything else combined up to this point. And if people are launching products, they're grinding for product market fit, they're going to get users, means crypto is going to survive. It's just like, that's going to happen. And totally, uh, thanks for this yeah. conversation. <laughs> it's, it's way more fun to have this conversation in the bear market, actually. It gives us a chance to mm -hmm. kind of take a breath and, the, and um, hear what's sure. really going on. And uh, we're, we're excited about what the Solana community is doing. So thanks for joining us. For sure. Oh, last question for you. Okay. You said monolithic chain with no sharding. Is that still the strategy? I, I'm just checking. Yeah. You sure about that? Yeah. There's, there's no way that mm -hmm. sharding is going to get information faster around the world. There you go. It's still the strategy. <laughs> you, it's still the difference. Anatoly, you said uh, that uh, if Solana can do more transactions than all of Ethereum L2s combined, is that? Do you think that that's going to happen? That Solana can do more TPS than all Ethereum L2s combined? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah. You got it. Got to admire the confidence right. here. And uh, yeah. yeah, game yeah. on, brother. <laughs> it's. Um, I think this is what levels up the entire crypto community as a bunch of builders. <laughs> Uh, in competitive games, friendly competitive games with one another. Uh, Anatoly, yeah. thanks so much for joining us. For we sure. appreciate you. All right. Bankless Nation will include some links in the show notes with some action items for you, some uh, further research you could do on Solana, also on the multi-client uh, architecture that Anatoly was uh, talking about. That was called F a Fire Dancer, am I correct, guys? Yes, Fire Dancer. Yeah. Uh, we'll have links to that too. As always, got to end with our risks and disclaimers. You must realize by now that crypto is pretty damn risky. You could lose what you put in, <laughs> but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the Bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.